Okay, well, welcome everybody to, uh, this is the first lecture in the final uh, group of lectures of economic engineering until we uh, go into uh, forming a new crop of students. And uh, it's uh, at the same time the final topic that we'll be treating as separate topics. So the first topic was the Newtonian demand and the F is M times A stuff, bond graphs and uh, all that jazz. The second topic was the Laplace transform, how we can do valuations. And now we're at the final topic in something that I consider probably the most beautiful of all topics in, well, in economic engineering, but also in mechanics, I think, and physics. And that is what is called analytical mechanics. And, um, in one of the first uh, attempts of me to uh, explain the principles of economic engineering, I actually started with this. And the reason I did was because, as you will see in these lectures, is uh, that it's really only through the use of the methods of analytical mechanics that you really understand and it becomes obvious what all this stuff is and where it all comes from and why it is right and why it has to be that way. You know, when we did uh, the demand theory, it all sounded nice and well, and it's the same with Newtonian mechanics. It all sounds nice and well, F is M times A, and that's the law of demand, and you just get used to the idea what an economic force is, and then you have these linear demand lines, and you think, okay, this economic force is related to price, and it all seems to work, but you never really understand why. Okay, it just seems very phenomenolo phenomenological and uh, after a while you'll just get the right results and you get used to it and then it all seems obvious but then when somebody really presses you, you, you can't really understand why. Why would price be momentum? You know, somebody says, could it be something else? And you go, yeah, well maybe, I don't really know the answer, right? And why is... Uh, in why is energy income? Yeah, now that's just the way it works out. But why it has to be that way, you don't really know the answer. And why it makes sense even for an economic agent to act this way. Now, this was also felt by the economists, especially of the 20th century. So there was a theory of demand, and it was laid down by... Uh, uh, Alfred Marshall, and I believe that was done in the, well, it, I, I know that was done in the 19th century. And uh, the law of demand was considered kind of the basis of it all, and it was obvious. But then another principle came up in the beginning of the 20th century, and that's the idea of utility. There were already uh, signs of it emerging from Pareto and others, but they were all 20th century, early 20th century. And then there was a sort of, then there was the from Neumann Morgenstern utility, where they put in expected utility and uncertainty, and it became the basis of uh, Bayesian statistics and decision theory. And there was a sort of feeling that the utility theory kind of explains everything. Okay, so it goes back to a very old principle. I believe it was Hobbes or some English philosopher who stated that it was the greatest happiness for the, the greatest number that was the whole point of everything. You know, so a human being is just trying to make himself happy, and the mathematical kind of content of that was that he was a utility maximizer. And it seemed a very satisfying thing, because you can look at a human being and say, well, I mean, why do you do stuff? Well, because I like it. You know, that's, you know, I mean, don't ask me questions. And you say, well, but I'm altruistic, and I do it for other people. And then you can take the attitude, well, he just likes doing things for other people, still there in it for himself, right? So this idea is, special, is a little bit modern. Maybe a medieval man wouldn't have thought of it that way because he was there because God put him there. But we are more like, oh, we're here, and uh, you know, now we're all like trying to make ourselves happy by taking lots of vacations and finding reward and work and blah, 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 blah. So the utility theory is a very popular way of looking at it. And uh, maximizing utility was the way a consumer would go. They had a little problem because companies, they would maximize profits. And it didn't seem that a company should maximize utility. So presto, they have a second theory for companies. And they were just going to be these institutions that would maximize profits. 
Uh, there was a separate, and they call it the conjugate theory for that, and then there was the theory of maximum utility, and that was for consumers. And then they have these two theories, and they try to derive everything going forward from that. Okay, so it's a very different approach to the law of demand, and in a lot of ways it makes uh, a lot more sense. You know, like a lot of us will say, yeah, of course you want to maximize utility, of course you want to make yourself happy. Like, let's take that as a starting point. And um, something a little bit similar happened in mechanics. So there was this idea that Lee Newton's law, it was a little bit strange to do it this way, but it seemed to work. But then people, especially uh, Lagrange and Hamilton, started looking at different ways of approaching that. So rather than this particle at every point in time, you know, cranking through a little differential equation and saying how it's going to change its velocity in the next instance of time, that's the acceleration due to a force, right? They imagined a different principle that the particle or any system maximizes or minimizes, you know, in the word, when you don't know whether it's either maximizes or minimizes, you call it stationary, looks for something that's stationary, all right? Because one thing, and, and, and that was more related to a scalar quantity. So they say, all right, so what's a maximum thing? Well, a vector I can't find a maximum of because it has this direction. So it's got to be the scalar quantity that I can order. And then I can maximize this. And it kind of came from the idea of energy and, 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 and those things. Okay, also entropy was also something that was maximizing. So could we explain the behavior just looking at minimization and maximization of scalar quantities. This is very absent in Newton's theory. In fact, the whole idea of energy is absent in Newton's theory, right? You can derive it from Newton's theory, but the theory is just independent of energy. And uh, this was developed and uh, on the basis of a theory for light. There was an idea that light did this thing. So light went ahead uh, to calculate how light would go from one point to another. How would you do that? It wasn't a particle. You couldn't see these things. And nobody was sure that it was a wave, although Huygens had convincingly argued that it was a wave, while Newton was convincingly arguing it was a particle. Nobody knew what it was. But everybody knew that it minimized the time to go from one place to another. That's what light did. So if you wanted to know what light was doing, you couldn't use Newton's equations. But you could uh, figure out what's the minimum time to go from one place to another. Now, that is a straight line if you just go through space. So light went into a straight line through space, a vacuum. But if you get light, uh, you, you, it goes through air, and then it goes through water, then it will uh, change its angle, right? And then they would say, well, that was a law, and it says, so how do we explain that? Well, it's still trying to minimize the time it takes to go between these two points. How does it do that? Well, there's a famous example about how that works. You know, now suppose you're a lifeguard, and somebody is drowning in the ocean, and you need to get in the minimum time to this person to save him or her. All right? Huh? So what do you do? Do you run in a straight line to the ocean and, and start swimming? Well, no, because you swim a lot slower than you run. So what you'll do is you'll start trying to run as much on the shore as you can and then swim as little as possible, and uh, in that way try to minimize the time it takes you to get to the person, the drowner. If you run too far, you're so far off that uh, you still got to swim a long way. So there is some optimum. And if you find that optimum, you know that you're light. Okay, so this is what light does, and this is why it does it that way. So light was this one quantity that the motion of it could be predicted by a minimum principle. Right? So this is kind of a separate theory, and they try to get that all together. They say, well, maybe the flight of a cannonball in a parabola also comes from a minimum principle. Or Hamilton imagined that the motion of any particle would be like light, come from a minimum principle. And uh, in fact, it does. And that's the theory that I'm going to talk about today. And it's called Lagrangian mechanics. From it derived will be another theory of Hamiltonian mechanics. That's the law of energy conservation on steroids. And uh, we'll step through that and how it relates to um, economics. Now, the thing 
about this. So here is the typical thing people would write. So you want to minimize this thing. For light, it's time. But in general, we call it the mechanical action for any particle. And that's the, 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 that thing is the cost, as it were, the penalty you have to pay to do something. And you accrue it over the time that you're running to this, uh, over the shore and swimming. Okay? And that thing that you're adding up or integrating out or accruing, as we would say, that's called a Lagrangian. So it's, this is the one equation that explains everything. So just minimize this guy, and you know what happens. All right, that's the, the thing. Now, it's somewhat amazing that this works. Of course, the trick is, what, what is this Lagrangian here, et cetera? Right? Now, this equation can also be read in an economic way. So <clears throat> what does a, an agent do? Well, he takes a course of action. That's the running. Course just means running, right? So there, huh? Or some activity. And what is he going to do? Well, he's going to, in this case, minimize his disutility or maximize his utility in doing so. You know? Now, as long as we know how much uh, utility he accrues over time, we can maximize this. Yeah. And then we should be able to calculate what he does. Now, suppose we do all that, and we get some formula, what he'll be doing. We could say, well, at this moment in time, he will change his quantity demanded by this much. You know, so he will extend his demand a little. So we'll be back to our old law of demand, Newton's law, F is M times A. But we better get there. And now in this lecture, what I want to do is show you how you can go from this principle back to our old law of demand and our bond graphs and everything nice and fine. Right? With one caveat, we can only do it for I elements and C elements. R elements are not covered by this theory. They aren't covered in physics. They aren't covered in, uh, well, they aren't covered in physics. Now, here at the Economic Engineering Group, where you all are, we have done a lot of work over the past to try to incorporate uh, damping into this formulism because it's such a natural thing, and damping is just so important in economics because it's the discounting process, it's consumption, it's all kinds of things that are essential. So it's been a, a major uh, kind of track of our research, a major focus of our research to get this uh, sorted out. And, uh, Kuhn has already published a paper on it. He did a very nice thesis on it, you know, nice enough to uh, have him uh, get locked up here in this prison, you know, so uh, <laughs> he won't be let out. And uh, we've made some other uh, recent progress. And what I'm going to do with this last lecture series, I'm going to start off just with a the regular theory with C and I elements. And then afterwards, I want to nevertheless open the Pandora box in uh, how uh, we are doing our elements. Right now, Emil is also doing his research on there uh, in this field. So uh, I think it's, you'll find it's not only a very beautiful theory, but a very exciting theory and where a lot of uh, progress can be made. Uh, Ozai's research is, is very much related to this, OK? If we ever hear about it, well, because we're waiting for him to give his uh, midterm presentation. Huh? All right, so this is the equation, and uh, this is what we want to do. Let me go click further. Here is the clicker. Let's see what I decided to talk about on the next slide. Oh, yes, space. So when you, when, uh, when you do this kind of uh, mechanics, you start off to, 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 with something called a configuration space. And um, what you do is you determine what the dimensions of your uh, problem are in mechanics. Now, in the Newtonian case, this uh, are just three dimensions. Newton just considered a single particle, and these are uh, just the three, the x, y, and z dimensions. Okay, but the nice thing of this approach is it's way more general. So you can imagine anything at all. So if this is mechanics, you could have a pendulum. And you could say, well, I'm only going to look at this angle. And that's one of these cues here. Or I can put another pendulum right on it, and then I have another angle here. And so that'll be Q1 and Q2, right? And then I can put a spring here and put another bar here. 
and then this distance here will be Q3. And I can make it up as I go along, right? So what we are here is in a level of generality that goes way beyond the little particle that Newton has. We have our entire system, and we look at the coordinates of the system. I'm sure you've done all these things in your mechanics course, right? Right, so you go and you figure out what all these coordinates are, and we call them the different Qs, okay? And they give the articulation of the system. We'll just call it the position, but really it's all the possible configurations of the system. It's probably a better word to call this the configuration of the system, right? So it's just a pure kinematic. So if you do your robotics course, you'll typically have these, uh, these kind of things with arms moving and, you know, extending and blah, 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 right? And for us, those are the different amounts quantities or stocks of variables. There's, the word stock is, comes from economists, they call it a stock variable, okay? Yeah, and uh, you shouldn't imagine that these really are stocked up in C elements or something. It's just a, a, an integrated amount of a flow variable that corresponds to all these velocities. But again, these are generalized velocities, so this could be omega one is, right? So, you look at every velocity, and it has this flow variable, and this relation to the velocity and the position is the same as there's a flows and, and stocks in economics. This is just some terminology, all right? Now, what you then do is in this configuration space, and here I just have a simple Newtonian particle just to get us going, but here the space is gonna look really funky because suppose I have these two uh, elements, then this one is on a circle, theta one. Uh, theta two is also on a circle, so I get a circle of circles, and you know, that's a donut, right? So this is theta one. But here, I'm just gonna make my life easier, so rather than drawing these donuts, you know, that only some students can do successfully in Tig Z, I'm just going to, uh, like that. But I want you to keep in mind something more general and at the end of everything I come back. Now obviously this particle or whatever that system is, this robot will move a little bit so these thetas will be moving and they'll do this in a continuous fashion, probably differentially too, they can't, don't just go jerk around. So you will get a nice path like this through call for acre space. Uh, this is called the path and they, I'm using the symbol gamma for it. And at any point in the path, so this is this point Q1, Q2, you can look at how these are changing, and that's the tangent vector of the path, and that is uh, the generalized velocity, which is, would be the general quantity demanded or the general flow. All right? That's our setup. So nothing much going on here that you don't all already know. You can think of this as an Edgeberg box if you really want, but you know, at this point, uh, we can be quite abstract about this. But there is a step that's made beyond Newton, which is really important to see. These, these variables could be very much quite anything that give you the configuration of your uh, system. All right? Okay? Is that all clear? Good. Well, let's see what goodies we have. Okay, now the question is, well, this is one path, the system, I just drew this, but it, the system could have done something completely different, right? It could have done this, or it got to go out of space and then go back and then do this. Huh? or make a tiny little change around, it could be anything at all. Now, of all the possible paths it undertakes, all the possible activity our economic agent does, what is, the, what is it that he is going to do, right? We need a criterion, right, for that. And that is the principle of minimum action. And that says, all right, we're gonna t look at, for every path, so that's every course of activity on the take, I'm gonna assign that a number, all right? So this is a, 
this is some, some path, right, for activity. So it's a complicated thing, right, in this space. And another path is another one, it goes around it. It's not just a bunch of numbers, right? It's all millions of numbers, millions, infinite numbers of numbers. I'm going to compare these, right? So for all possible paths, I'm going to calculate only one number. This number is called the action. And I will call this the period cost here. I measure it in dollars. The action is in joules or times seconds, OK? And that number I'm going to assign, and I'm going to look at the minimum. Uh, I'm going to look at which path takes this as a minimum value. All right, and that I'm going to call the optimum path or the maximum value, the stationary one. Now, for some reason, the math cal s didn't come through here. The one way to do that is to look at if I vary the path a little bit, this will be zero. Let me come back to that. How you get that? All right, but the idea should be clear. We gotta find out what path we're gonna take. We we invent this thing, and it's not really a function, it's really a function null because it's not a function of numbers or vectors or something like that. It's a, a function on paths. I mean it's a really weird thing, right? Huh? That's why I put these square brackets here. Just to alert you, this is really weird. Huh? And um, I'm gonna give you a little bit of help in how to calculate this thing. I'm gonna say, well. There is something called a Lagrangian that if I integrate it along the path, I can actually get this. All right? Huh? I'll talk a little bit more about what that is. All right? But that's the basic setup. All right? Now, how do I find something that is minimum or maximum? Now, you could say if I have a function, you know, here's a function. Huh? I want to find the maximum. How do I find this? Well, I just take the derivative, I check whether it's zero, right? Huh? And then there you have it. Now, why does that work? Why does that work? Why, if you have this function f, you just look at the derivative and set it to zero. Why does that work? What's the intuition behind that? Ozai, do you know? Huh? You know this, right? What's the intuition? Why would this work? As the function very small. Yeah. Let me just. I mean, it it does. But let let's let's uh, let's look at it. Let let's look at this. Huh? I mean, this is kind of a. Interesting. I mean, it's easy to forget how easy this is. Suppose I was here, right? Huh? And I make a small amount change, as I suggest, right? Huh? Then I can go this way, and the function will be bigger, right? So df dx will be bigger than zero, right? But if I go the other way, then df dx will be smaller than zero. Yeah, so there are two ways to change. Either I go in this direction, right? Yeah, so I can go this direction, right? Huh? Yeah. And then I will find that uh, I, the, the, the f decreases, right? Huh? Sorry, this is wrong. So look at a change in f, huh? right? And uh, this, if this is positive, then if you go, then this one is also positive. But if this is negative, then this one is also negative, right? Huh? So that means if I have a small change, then if I go to the right, I, I, I go up the mountain, I go to the left, I go down, right? Now think about you climbing up a mountain and you're here and you want to know whether you're on the top. You try, this way I go down, so maybe I'm at the top. You try the other way, I'm going up, so I can't be at the top, all right? So this thing precludes the fact that you're at the top, right? This would preclude that you're at the bottom, you're neither, right? So what do you want to do? You want to say, all right, so I can, by going this way, I can increase this thing a little bit, so let's go over there, right? Huh? 
So you see, you can still increase it. So then you're over here. Then you can't increase it anymore, right? But can you decrease it? No, you can't decrease it either, right? Huh? No, because as you go the wrong way, it's still zero, the change in F, right? So you're at a maximum or a minimum, right? So if the sign differs, you know you can still go either lower or higher. Is that clear? Did you follow that? Everybody is either thinking this is so obvious. Huh? Is that fine? That's why the derivative test works, right? So, you know, if you're a hiker and you're walking up a mountain, you only know you're at the top if a small step doesn't change your, your level where you're in. Huh? Okay? Now, that's the same with paths. So, if I take one path here and I take another one that's just close to it, you know, and what a close means is a little bit difficult, but you have to kind of add up all these changes, then it can't be that the action changes, right? The idea is the same. So we must be in a valley. So we're in this whole mountain ridge, and we're looking at the path, you know, the low road. We can either look at the high road, or another song goes, or the low road, right? Huh? And the low road, you try to wiggle a whole path where you don't go anywhere up the mountain. And the high road, you have a similar one, right? Huh? Where you go through all the tops if you have a mountain ridge, and you can find the high road there. That's where they place the roads. Huh? Isn't there a song, you take the low road and I take the high road? And I'll be in Scotland before you. So this is what the path is, right? So you try to find the minimum path in your mountain or the... A river will find the low road. Huh? Yeah, some goat will probably be wa walking on the high road, huh? if it exists, right? You don't know whether any of this exists. This may not exist either. You go to uh, the Grand Canyon, there's the river. It's all the way at the bottom, and at the top, you can just walk along the ridge. But you can't go uh, that way. So that's the idea, right? So we vary this path, so the river kind of varies how it meanders through, so that it minimizes this thing. Well, that's what we're going to do. So as it's meandering, it's like going, at this point in time, I'm here. This is what it does. That's the concept we're going to use for an agent. So he is in this environment, and he is like this hiker. He's, this, you know, he's trying to find the smoothest way to go from one place to another. And everywhere he meets this mountain of disutility, of these costs, these awful things. You've got to spend money. I'm going to spend the least I can, you know? I'm going to try to stay as flat as possible. Right? Why go up and then down? That's the, 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 the setting. And you have to make that decision every time as you're uh, meandering, right? As you're hiking. That's the picture. And this thing you do at the moment, is your, what I would say is your running cost. So that's the, while you're running along, huh, you're kind of like figuring out how you can balance this out, minimize this thing, and then uh, what you want to do is minimize the total. So say I drive from Holland to go skiing in, uh, in Austria, you know, I may decide that, uh, I'm going to start with an empty gas tank, or not too empty, because I want to arrive at the border, and then as soon as I'm over the border, I'm going to pump my, because I go very slow, because I get huge tickets if I go faster, and with a low gas tank, and I just over the border, I start pumping up, and then I speed up, right? Huh? So I won't be like light, I'll be changing my speed, and I'll be changing all kinds of things because of my cost environment, right? I don't want to get a ticket, I don't want to pay for gasoline, you know, and then, uh, so I drive fast in Germany, and I drive slow in Holland, and I tend gas in Germany, and uh, all kinds of stuff, all right? Okay? Now, we'll be talking about what this Lagrangian is. I already wrote it down. This has to do with the potential energy. This is the uh, kinetic co-energy. So these are the costs, and these are you subtract the benefits. 
and we'll be talking about how this is just one giant cost-benefit analysis. All right? So that's the intuition. So the thing about these kind of setups is they, 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 if you take a course in analytical mechanics, it gets a little hocus-pocus. Why would you want to do this? But I think the economic interpretation of minimizing cost is, is, is an easy one. You know, you imagine yourself a hiker through this mountain of different disutilities and you're trying to find your way in there. And of course what we want to find is that under what conditions you're going to get the law of demand and partial equilibrium and all that kind of thing. So let's keep going. So here I made a little picture of what's going on and this is a famous picture. And uh, it's a picture of a wave. And this is this idea that went back to Huygens' idea of light. And I, get, I guess there was Snell, it was another Dutch guy, but he didn't think the name Snell was too fancy, so he called himself Snellius. That's when uh, oh, fancy speak people spoke uh, Latin, so uh, he's either known as Snellius or just Snell. And he figured out that this is the way uh, light or diffraction would go. So how you can start uh, light was a wave, and this kind of picture can be indeed seen as sort of a wave going through there, which is kind of a complementary picture to the picture I just created now as a river or a hiker trying to find its way, right? So the wave picture looks more at what the costs are and how you can go through there. So here is what the picture looks like. Again, I see that I did a bit of bad job in making these uh, math gal. It's hardly visible that this is an S, right? But it is. It looks more like a J to me. But let's not be too picky about it. So here is, uh, here is the picture you have. So you're going through there. And as you go through there, you accumulate costs. And these are, these are the cost front. This is called a front. So here your cost is zero, or some, some S zero, then you accumulate to S, and then finally these are the costs at your final time. And the rate at which you do that is called the Lagrangian, and you can kind of picture it as a sort of an ellipse. And then here's your velocity, so at this ellipse is centered at this, this kind of shape here, some oval, which is not really an ellipse, I just drew it like one, it's just some, sort of an oval. And uh, that gives you the unit amount of running cost if you go either direction. And then you'll see that uh, ultimately this is how he uh, minimizes its cost. This is the wave picture here. Now let's go through an example about how this might work. So we start with this Lagrangian, which uh, we were going to call the running cost. So as you go through there, you calculate what your running costs are to minimize the total period cost to you as you undertake this journey through activity land. Now, to get a regular harmonic oscillator Newtonian system consisting of an I element and a C element, this would be the Lagrangian, right? Now, well, how do you know that? Well, you don't. I mean, these things are, uh, if you uh, do mechanics, they'll just tell you that this is it. So notice this thing is, is the difference between the kinetic co-energy and the potential energy. It's not equal to the total energy, which is the sum of the kinetic energy. And the... So it's almost like he's looking at the difference between these two. Huh? Almost, that is precisely what is still meant. Now, in mechanics, this gets presented as a sort of a mystery. And uh, I think if you read Feynman, he, he is the best way of kind of unraveling this mystery and making it uh, intuitive. But what I think is, before we even do that, let's just look at the economic engineering side of things 
and ask ourselves the question whether this is not uh, intuitive to begin with, all right? Now, what is this thing saying? What is this kinetic co-energy? Well, that's really this area under this curve. Why is that? Because it's the, you know, you're looking at a change in demand. You're increasing your demand. You're extending your demand at a particular price, right? So the area of this little increase of your demand is the price times the change in your quantity demanded. Now that's obviously the cost to you because this is your reservation price. <coughs> this is the marginal, this is the extension of demand. So this is the amount extra per year that you're buying. So the cost to you is precisely this. All right? So this whole thing integrated Did it come here? So this is the cost, this is the marginal cost of a small extension of your demand. These are the total cost to you of parting with your products if you're a supplier. But this is the price you're getting for it all, so the difference is going to be the surplus, or in a sense your profit, what you're getting extra beyond what it costs you, right? Well, the cost to you is the reservation time price times the marginal increase of the amount you're buying, right? So this we call the cost, right? Yeah? You should remember this from uh, your last lecture, uh, your, your previous lecture, all right? And this was the surplus. This thing here is a half and B squared. This is the kinetic co-energy. They are numerically the same, so we often in mechanics, we ignore this and call, both call them kinetic energy, but they really are different, right? Okay. Now let's look at, um, and this picture here on the left, I got this from... Uh, Now, just to drive this home, this is a picture that's out of Marshall's book, his 19th century book on where he expounds on the theory of demand. I forgot what its name is. What is the name of that book? Emil, do you remember? Principles of Economics, yeah. So you see it's not a straight line. Here he has his uh, producer line, and then he sees that he calls his expenses, what we now call the cost. I prefer to call it cost than expenses. And he calls the surplus rent. Now, nowadays, everybody calls this surplus, not rent anymore. But economic rent used to be another name for the surplus. We are, we are using it as a, uh, for the entire Hamiltonian. So does he say that producer surplus, so producer rent plus consumer rent, that is what you call surplus? No. Okay. Just the, the, we look, just look at one guy. Oh, so oh, we're, we're ignoring the consumer. Yeah, 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 because it's a different particle with a different law, all right? Yeah, huh? yeah. yeah. and that one is flipped, and that's why you see the surplus on the wrong side of the equation, all right? Huh? So uh, he would have his own cost, you know, now, uh, okay? We have a symmetrical theory, right? So, but 
I just want to show you that he thinks of an expenses. I don't really like that word because in, in, uh, in accounting, uh, there's a difference between a cost and expense. A cost is associated with a particular product, you know, like you're selling these things and that's the cost. The cost of goods sold is a particular product and expense doesn't have to be. So if you expense things, it means you can have a bunch of things that, uh, you know, we have a bunch of, uh, the typical example is a bunch of pencils that you order uh, for your business. Nobody is, ha keeps inventory of how many they have. It's just a certain expense you make over the year, all right? It's not associated with a particular uh, V in this case, all right? You're just expensing it. You're writing it straight into the, uh, in the income statement. Now, I prefer to call this a cost. And I prefer to stick with the modern terminology of calling this particular piece uh, the surplus. But the idea is the same, all right? And the intuition is very clear, you know that? So the marginal cost is just PDV, né? and P is M times VDV, and if you integrate that, you get a half M squared, right? Huh? So this is the cost, so okay. Huh? So the total running cost is going to have this, this guy right in here. Right? Huh? There's no doubt about that. So that makes a lot of sense. Now, what about our C elements? Okay. So if we didn't have any C elements, we were done, and we would have a nice uh, Lagrangian. Now, what about our C elements? Well, remember that uh, you have a certain amount of stock stock that you're holding, you know, and this you can derive some convenience from that. Those are, uh, yeah. It's how convenient it is to have the stuff around. And because of that, you know, the marginal convenience which you get from increasing your stock, you know, over some amount Q is precisely the convenience times that DQ. And this is what we call the benefit that you acquire from holding that stock. All right? Okay? Now, that's a benefit. So, you can't add a benefit to that. You got to subtract that. So, this this if you have this I element and C element together, then together it's got to say, well, these are the costs I'm making through my sales activity. I have to subtract the current benefits I derive from holding uh, these items. Okay, otherwise this is not correct. Why does one of the so why does the medical intensive property Changing variables or the potential energy. Well, just because of the interpretation, if you made this extensive, it would be a surplus, not a cost. Yeah, VDP is not the same as PDV, right? This is a sort of profit because you're selling this amount and I'm now raising the price, DP. Okay, that's just not a cost. Yeah. A profit is not a cost. I can't call that a running cost. So I'm there trying to figure out how to minimize all the costs to me. Why would I be plugging in this in? You know, I know that you're saying it's extensive, but the, 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 the issue is uh, that's not the issue. The issue is we're looking at cost. Don't worry, when we look at the Hamiltonian, we'll do a Legendre transform, and this thing, the total energy, H, will be... Okay, and this is the way bond graphs are formulated. So you'll have an energy storage element here and an energy storage element here. But this is not a bond graph approach to things. You're not storing any energy. You're looking at what the costs are, you know? So we're looking at a path through a space, and at every moment, I gotta figure out what the costs are to me. And I don't really care how much momentum I have in storage or what the prices are, you know? I don't really care, you know? I'm not trading. I'm not doing it for the trading, I'm doing it to get there. You know, I'm just acquiring the stuff, okay? Now I think you just, it's a good question, but the, the answer is a little bit silly, like, well, that's just not the, the thing we want to have here, right? Naturally speaking, this is the, huh? this is what you need, right? And these benefits, you just got to subtract it. So you look at your total cost, that is the real cost minus the benefits, you know? And is the other side of benefits inconvenience? Inconvenience? If we 
would be to define an intangible pro uh, property there. I don't understand the question, but the other side of benefits would be this side, right? Exactly. But a benefit. Yes. A convenience is a force, it's not an energy, all right? Huh? So what it's gonna be is it's gonna be some sort of surplus, okay? What's negative then? The first point I wanna make is you can't call this inconvenient because the convenience would be F here and inconvenience would be minus F and that's just not an energy, all right? Well, that's the first point I wanna make about your question, right? Huh? Okay. So don't phrase it that way, huh? So it would be not minus benefits, because minus benefit is minus benefit. It's not true that cost is minus surplus. No, cost plus surplus is total revenue, right? Huh? Exactly. Uh, I said negative, but I mean negative in a... <laughs> what you mean to say is FQ minus V is equal to this V star, right? So you take F times Q, which is this area, you subtract that, and you get this area, right? Huh? Yeah, and how do you call that? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know how you call it. We don't you really use it. Potential co-energy, right? It's some sort of surplus, some sort of extra you get, right? Just like this is. Yeah, but this uh, is the, I don't know what it is. No, that's not a surplus. I'm sorry. Yeah, I don't know. Oh, that way, yeah. I don't know what it is. I, I, in mechanics, nobody uses it, right? You can call it the potential curve energy, and in economics, also, nobody really looks at it, you know? Huh? I don't know. I don't have a term for it. And, and, and thirdly, we're going to do Hamiltonian mechanics. We only do a Legendre transformation here. Huh? So we're never going to do that one. I don't say never say never, but I, 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 not in this course. I, I, you don't know. And also, where uh, in Termo you had like five uh, Legendre transforms, right? From the internal energy to the Gibbs energy. Uh, there are multiple in, uh, in terminal. Oh, yeah, so he means to say, that's not a bad remark. It, it's taking us off course, but, uh, you know, so you can say that this FDQ is like uh, PDV, right? So instead of a force times a displacement, you do a pressure times a volume, and then you look at VDP instead, and that's true. That's uh, the enthalpy, right? Yeah, so yeah. you take the end, look at the enthalpy, right? So the enthalpy is also a sort of circular plus, right? So if, you're, if you allow your piston to expand against the environment, what is the work you get for free from the environment that the enthalpy gives you? And if it's in constant pressure, you can add it, right? Because you know dp is zero, right? So yeah, it's some sort of surplus that you get from interacting with an environment. You know now, like an enthalpy, right? So the Gibbs free energy also contains it. But in mechanics, it's not used. In uh, in economics, in thermo, yes. And part of Ozai's research will, of course, enlighten us all, and you in particular, about the role of eh? the potential co-energy. Yeah, good question. Off topic, but good. Well, I don't want to say off topic in the bad way, but more so that we st it's clear what our focus is here. Our focus is going to be on uh, you know, analytical mechanics and these particles, not on thermodynamics. Okay? Good. So what I want to do is do one more slide and go through the, uh, I want to go through a couple of examples in the way Feynman does it. Feynman, by the way, has a really nice uh, little article in his lectures 
that he uh, finally made a huge career out of this principle. Actually, he is the one that, that, that brought it to the big time, okay? Um, when they were doing quantum mechanics, they had an equation of motion. They couldn't use new, regular Newton's laws of uh, motion. You know, I'll just do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we still have a little bit of time. They couldn't. It's just interesting to know if it's only because you can think about how this applies to economic engineering. So Newton's laws was all fine and well for all these particles. All this stuff is moving, cannonball, blah, 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 blah. And then they invented quantum mechanics, right? So they found out you have these photons. You know, now, these are very small particles. It's not so clear whether it's a particle or a wave. So you already see the exciting part about this approach. We can look at the action of sort of a wave, a co wave cost as a wave, but you can also look at it as a finding a path um, in this thing you know, now going on. Okay? So you get this kind of dual picture of an economic agent, one that is riding the cost wave or the utility wave, and the other one finding, uh, you know, at any moment in time, deciding which way to go. Is he a particle or is he just this other thing that behaves as if it were a wave, all right? And um, with quantum mechanics, they figured out that although they thought light was different from regular particles, really, Light is a little bit both. As Newton was right, it was a little particle or called a photon, but Huygens was right at the same time. It was also a wave, you know, because it showed diffraction of all these things, you know. It was more like a wave. So, uh, what was I going to say? So, this is a, a bit of a problem. So, Heisenberg, he was one of these quantum mechanical guys, he figured out how to write a sort of a equation of motion, like Newton's law for particles. And it looks a little bit like a wave, and it's called the Heisenberg equation. The, Sch the Schrodinger did this, I'm sorry. Schrodinger is another German scientist. They had a whole pile of them. Uh, Schrodinger figured out sort of the equation of motion. It looks a little bit like a wave equation, by the way. And uh, so he says, well, I don't really know why it works, but this is what it is, and this is uh, the equation of motion, not Newton's equation, but this is the one that works for these particles, okay? And uh, he was qu actually quite modest about it. Then Heisenberg started uh, messing around with energy and more of a, what we now would call a Hamiltonian approach, and it was all kind of fuzzy. And then Feynman was the first to say, look, you just got to look at it through minimum action, because this Heisenberg equation, it's not quite correct, and the interpretation is a little bit shaky, so when they started doing calculations, they never would work out. Everything would blow up in their faces and become infinity and this and that. And then Feynman came around, and they first declared him an idiot, of course, because he talks with this heavy Brooklyn accent. But then he kept getting the right answers where they were getting no answers, so then they started paying attention to him. And then it appeared that he was, that was the best way to look at it. So that you use this, this principle of minimum action to look at these particles going, you know, that's the right thing. And then that, that just resolved everybody. The Schrodinger equation came out, Heisenberg's uh, stuff came out, all these, uh, you know, uh, yeah, all this duality stuff they have, uh, uh, complicated brackets and matrix. Uh, momenta, and uh, et cetera. So he kind of unifies it in, uh, using this principle of minimum action. And he relates back to an old teacher, Mr. Bader, I remember, uh, uh, from reading him, who taught about this principle. And he was at, the, the teacher was fascinated about him, and Feynman got fascinated about him, and the principle. And uh, he has this little uh, special lecture in his lectures on physics where he relates this, and it's really worth reading to get a good uh, feeling for it. And he does a, a fantastic job of, of saying, well, here is a particle, he takes this thing, and why would it, I mean, he says, like, it's so crazy, why would this particle minimize this action? I mean, it's like a human being, how does he know, right? Huh? Why would he do that? Well, here's what the particle is really doing, and he says, why, well, why doesn't the particle, well, this is a gravitational field, right? So I throw this, this ball, you know, and I throw it out, so it's going to do this. This is a parabola. Now, why would it do that? Now, you could say, well, there's a force looking down all this. But no, what, why, why can I explain that it does this by 
minimizing this integral of this thing. Well, says Feynman, it's not so hard because look, this thing is huge if the kinetic uh, co-energy is huge, right? So as soon as you have a high speed, you want to climb up to a bit high altitude to increase your potential energy so you bring down the total value of your Lagrangian, right? Huh? But if you bring it, if you go too high, that's no good later because then you got to speed up again. So you want to find this balance between, you know, slowing down and uh, going high. And this is exactly the balance the particle does at this point. Okay. So here it has way too much kinetic energy, and here it's subtracting the potential energy to try to keep that difference as low as possible. And the way it does it is going through uh, a parabola. We would just say, listen, these are his uh, costs, these are the benefits he accrues. He wants to get his total cost minimized, so he's got these costs, so he's better to start putting a bunch of stuff in storage, so he gets some benefits out of this stuff, and not like, oh, I'm stealing like a maniac, right? Huh? So keep some for his benefit, so he can enjoy the ride a little bit, instead of selling all this stuff, right? And then that will be the way he's going to make himself minimum cost to go here. Notice how simple it is, right, when you do economics, if you just interpret this stuff right. You know, so of course he's going to do that. This thing is, is, is known as a cost-benefit analysis, right? There it is. So any course of action, there's this guy Dupuis, I think he's an economist, and it gets used by a lot of governments and other people, businesses. They look at a project, and in order to do the project, they have something they call a cost-benefit analysis. So they just look at all the costs that are associated with it, then all the benefits they derive from it. You look at the difference, huh? and you either maximize the benefits minus the cost, or you minimize the cost minus the benefits. I mean, that's how simple it is. Now, the nice thing of economic engineering is the I elements can tell you what your costs are, the C elements tell you what the benefits of ownership are, you just subtract the two and you have, uh, you have your cost-benefit uh, analysis completely done for the, uh, you know, for the problem. And it's completely obvious why you would want to do that. One thing that is not really obvious in Feynman's uh, story, of course, I mean, he does a really good job explaining this. Most physicists will say, well, that's just the way it is. We do also don't know. But why, why would a particle care about this kinetic energy? What does that represent? Now, it's only when you have this stark interpretation of the cost, right, that it becomes obvious. And the whole thing becomes a cost-benefit analysis. It becomes also clear that you got to take, pay attention to the begin point, the end point, you know, and you try to, you know, so you go from here to there, because the period, because if you go somewhere further, you know, you know, there's a whole bunch of stuff. If you drive to Italy or you drive, I don't know where, there's a bunch of stuff you need to keep it, take advantage of and figure out, okay? So you fix your end point, and you just do your cost-benefit analysis. That's just basically what it is. So let's do, uh, let's see how we do this with the break. I want to do these two simple examples and then take a break. Let's do this uh, example here. So I have two points. I'm just going in a straight line, right? So from a mechanical point of view, what's going on here? It's just a free particle, right? So it's going at a constant velocity with this thing. This is what Newton's first law would tell us. All right? Now, why is that obvious from, uh, from uh, minimizing this integral? Well, there's no, uh, right? So what I want to do is I want to minimize this thing, right? Here we are. So this can be, we can chug away, right? Why is it going to go in a straight line if I minimize the integral of the kinetic uh, co-energy? Well, the average of squares is always less than the square of an average, right? So, yeah, pretty clear that you can, this is what comes out. You can calculate it, huh? but... Uh, 
that's what you want to do. Now, if you start varying this velocity, so the thing is going at a constant velocity in a straight line, suppose you're going in this line, well, it's going to be longer, right? There's going to be more, right? But suppose you go like a bat out of hell here and then you slow down, it will also be more. Because you're squaring this stuff, right, and then adding it, and you know, if you, 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 you uh, square them, this is really going to blow up the big part. So you'll find that you want to have evenly spaced, okay? Is easily checked. I'm not even looking at an effort now. What do you mean by effort? Average. Oh, average. No, you're just calculating. You're calculating this thing, right? Huh? So, so at any point here. I look at this value of the uh, T star. So I look at a half and V squared. I integrate that over dt. And this is a function of time, right? Huh? Yeah. So what I'm saying is if V is a constant, that's how you get this thing to be minimal. Because if it's not a constant, you have some big numbers, you're squaring the hell out of that, you know now. And everybody knows that if you sum a whole pile of squares, then uh, that's always going to be minimized if you need, you keep that thing, uh, you know, now. You can check it. We'll check it later. Also, it's not a binary combination. This is T initial, and this is T final. Huh? Huh? So my idea, if, you, if, if you're going here at a uniform velocity, you square all those, and this is, this is just a constant, you can pull, pull this out, right? Huh? Now this thing is minimum when V is constant, okay? So if you vary it, if you have a huge one here, then it will show up in the square, it will uh, get very big, and then the other ones will be small. All right? Anyway, this is what you get. You get uniform motion. So it just gives us, uh, part, this is what uh, we call partial equilibrium, right? And we'll make the calculations in a little bit, okay? But just to give you a feel for it, huh? So this, this seems to make sense. So if you have no benefits from tanking in Germany over tanking in Holland, what you will do is you'll just go constant speed from Delft down to uh, Kitzbühel, right? Huh? Straight line. <clears throat> because the road, you can go, you can go, they made a straight road, and you take that. You take your airplane, the airplane is going to get as fast as I can, it will just go with a, you know, a bird will go with a straight line at a constant speed to minimize the effort between two things, okay? Huh? This is just what it will do. But I think to realize you get, you know, uh, uh, free motion of particles, Newton's first law. You get it for free here, out of your principle. And you know how you have equi uh, partial equilibrium, where you just have some velocity and then nothing happens, you know, you have some price and the price is just constant. Huh? That's what you get, right? But you get it in two dimensions here or any dimensions or something like that. All right, huh? So you have no benefit, so we have no convenience acting on it. You have no, so you have no C elements, you have no R elements. The thing is just gonna come out. Huh? This thing we already did. You can look at a harmonic oscillator. You'll find the same thing as just kind of trying to do it intuitively, right? So after the break, we'll figure out why this uh, all made sense. Well, how to calculate all this. Feynman does a much better job than I do uh, for explaining why this is really interesting. Okay? All right, so uh, we'll take a short break and then uh, we'll be back. Okay. Um, 
Now we want to make some progress and start. So up to now, we just laid out the intuition, the feeling, why is the case. We guessed a couple of them. We're not as good as Feynman is in this business, uh, to make it clear to you. But uh, it's not my ambition to be that good. What I want to do now is keep proceeding and derive uh, the law of demand. So where we are, we have this whole new way of doing things. But we already had a law of demand. We already knew what an I element was and what a C element was and all of this. So we had an equation of motion that we got out of that. So we want to go back to that and say, see under what conditions we can go back to that. So what we're going to do is we're going to do this uh, variation of the paths and, uh, and then calculate how we can minimize this thing. So what we want to do is set, look at the variation of this thing as we wiggle the path, and we want to set that equal to zero. Now, just some terminology that goes along with that. Here is the, say, the actual path, which you should be doing. So that's the actual activity that we're buying these two goods, and you know, he's doing first this, 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 and then that, so many pears, so many apples, and he's figured out that this is the uh, most optimal to him. Now, how would you figure out that this is the most optimal? Now, there was an economist, and his name was Walras, and he imagined this process of equilibrium to go along what he called, a, what is now called a Walrasian auction. So he was a Frenchman, so he introduced this idea of what is now called a tautonement. So for the French speakers, you would say tautonement, and it means tateas, to, to touch. Huh? So what Walras has in the mind is to make small changes and kind of figure out whether this is going anywhere, or is it going well, and these small changes that you would imagine, not really do, you know, these are he called tautonomants. Okay? So you have this path where it is your optimal, and you start varying it a bit. But you can consider really huge variation, doesn't matter, but at any point you can vary it, and that variation at that point is called a, a tautonomant. And we, in mechanics, don't use this terminology. We use different terminology, and there's a whole field of calculus that was associated with this that was developed by people like Lagrange and Euler who solved these equations. It's called the calculus of variation. You probably have heard of this and probably have used it without really understanding, of course, what it is. And then normally you solve these problems in the calculus of variations, and then they say integration by parts somewhere, and blah, 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 and then you go, and this so is the. For instance, right? So when you have the principle of virtual work, what do you do? You imagine that the thing would be moving a little bit, and then you calculate how, and that's, you call that a virtual movement or a variation. And then you calculate the work it would do if it were to be moving that way, right? Eh? And then what you want is that you're at a point where this vanishes, where this is zero. So you see the principle of virtual work that you all know so well, right? I believe this is your first year, is finding these type of optima, okay? Nobody, Nobody gets it in the first yeah. year. Nobody gets it? Yeah. Huh? <laughs> 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 But anyway, you do remember that what you want to do is set the virtual work equal to zero, right? So what you're doing, you're looking at this thing, and you're saying, I can imagine all these motions, and when the work that has to be done is zero, then I find that I'm at the uh, equilibrium, right? And this is no different, right? So you're imagining I'm buying a little bit more, right? Huh? Or I'm extending my demand a little bit, right? And I'm just seeing what's going to happen to my total cost. Right, my period cost. Okay. So this is sometimes called a what-if scenario in business, where you imagine all these different courses of action, and you try to say, well, what if we did this? Oh no, this is worse. Oh no, this is worse. No, this is better. This is worse, worse, worse. And you basically are doing this kind of business. All right. So this is a virtual. You can also call this as a virtual displacement. And uh, it's kind of curious that that would work. Nobody gets it when it's about the principle of virtual work. But of course, when you do economic, everybody, uh, economics, everybody gets it. You, somebody suggests, well, why don't we take this road 
you know, the other highway in Germany, you say, no, that one is longer. Or, you know, yeah, but they have a better restaurant. Or, you know, huh? you, see, you sit imagining all this stuff when you plan out your route. Okay? So that's some terminology that goes along with that. And then, so now that we know what that terminology is, let's just go and calculate this thing. So we've got to look at the variation of our period cost, our total cost, and we've got to set this equal to zero, right? Now, we know that the total cost is this integral, right? It's the integral of our running cost, of our Lagrangian. So I can just write this, I'll just plug that in, right? Everybody cool, right? Now, this are, these are all linear operators, right? So uh, virtual displacement is a very small one. It's only first order effect, it's also only small. I can flip these two, right? Eh? No problem, right? Eh? So you see this one, you see this one, you see this one. Right? Now then I just evaluate this thing. So I just use the chain rule, right? So the change in the running cost, the Lagrangian, the Lagrangian, remember, depends on Q and V. And I did it here the other way around. So I look at the partial change, so the marginal change of the running cost with an extension of demand times that virtual extension, right? Plus the one for I look at the change of the running cost if I increase my stock, right? Okay, so I say, well, I can, there's two ways my running cost can increase or decrease, one with a change in demand and the other one with a change in the cost. And I'm just gonna add those two up and then I know what a total variation of my running costs are or my Lagrangian, okay? Simple, so this is the chain rule, right? Okay, now comes the beautiful part. One of the beautiful parts. What is this thing? The change in your running cost per uh, demand extension. What are the units of this thing? Kunyan, can you tell me that? It's real easy. Now this thing, the units of the marginal change in running cost. So the units of this are in dollars per year, right? Huh? And this one? items per year, right? Eh? Okay, so what's the total uh, unit? Yeah, which is like a price, right? So, maybe it's a price, well maybe it is the price, it's, of course it's the price. What's the change in your cost when you increase the amount you buy? It's always the price, okay? Eh? You know, that's the cost to you, right? This is what we know. This is the most intuitive definition of price that you can give. If I say, okay, price is that thing that shows up in a demand graph, and here's P and here's V, why? Because Marshall says so, it's not so intuitive. You have to kind of get used to that. What is this? The reservation price. But when I say the price is defined to be this, this is very clear, okay? So price is just the marginal cost. Huh? Per unit marginal cost, huh? Per unit, huh? So what I do here with something really beautiful, I say, look, don't tell me they can't define momentum as P is M I V. You know, I don't care anymore. That's just one instance. This is the definition of price. All right. So I, can you show up with any Lagrangian, I'm going to defi define this to be price. Okay. In mechanics, this is the definition of momentum, and they usually call that the canonical momentum, all right? So this is a beautiful move, because price kind of came out of nowhere in the other treatments, and now it has a definition, right? So we're doing good. That means you're doing good, because you have less concepts floating around that all have to fit together. You just have this one thing, this action and this Lagrangian, all right? Yeah? I can take it one step further and define this thing, right? With a bit of hindsight, I can call that the convenience. It's just the potential force for this thing. It's not usually done in mechanics. Sometimes people do it, but uh, use this as the definition of force. I wouldn't call any force, and not every force is derivable from, uh, from this potential. That's why I call it the potential force, right? Huh? That's right. Thank you. Huh? 
That's right. So now I have the definition of what I call the convenience. All right? It could be anything. It doesn't have to be spring. It could be another convenience. You know, as long as I have it as a, as a partial derivative, so the marginal increase of the running cost if I increase my, my uh, stock. Okay? That's the convenience to me. What are the units of this thing, uh, of Kunyan? Uh, eh? No, because uh, the Lagrange is dollars per year, but this is now a Q, remember? Huh? So that's in items, so it's uh, eh, just like a convenience should be. Huh? There's this time factor in here that uh, is in a force, right? Okay? The units is roll out. But you know, the thing you've got to see is there's a, it can't be the same because the units of the, quality, the, the flow is not the same as the units of the stock. Yeah. Okay? Huh? Okay? So I'm not even done with my whole maximization and I already put in place you know, a couple of really breakthrough things. I first, the first person now who knows what price, how price is defined instead of coming out of nowhere. You'll see a lot of economics texts that will even define equilibrium in terms of price. You know well? No, they don't. Oh, they do? Yeah. Oh. Uh, both, both yeah. With respect to utility, right. Yes. Something that really helped me when I was doing that already based on the yes. something might be Yeah, so one of the things that roll out is, is this choice of the state, right? So the examples I've given is that these are stocks and measured on this, but it could be anything else. It could be in percentages or could be, I don't know what, right? And you will still have another price. It will be some generalized price, what something we've been calling credit, and credit is the price for interest, for instance. Huh? So by canonical, it means it rolls out of this, but it's at the same time this generalized concept of price. It's way more general than the Newtonian, uh, Marshallian uh, demand uh, concept of uh, momentum on the one side and price on the other, right? That's the important thing to realize here. These are just enormously general things. So you set up this configuration space you know, you know what your velocities are, you can take, and you have a Lagrangian, you can take these partial derivatives, and you'll just figure out what is your price and what is your this. You know, everything is clear from this setup. And so that's a really good remark. That's what is meant by canonical here. It's according to the canon, right? The church is a canon that prescribes how one thing will flow from another. Huh? Yeah. So off topic, but then do you know why they call it a canon? Well, from this this whole, uh, yeah, it's the only one you can choose based on the assumptions that you make with your model. In that sense, it's canonical. It follows the canon of the argument yeah, so you set up. The, the, the control, for example, temperature. Okay. Precisely, right? Huh? Also based right. On those, huh? That is the partition. Right. So it comes from early the church history, right? They have the canon. That was the way you were supposed to teach uh, Christianity. So in the late Roman Empire, early Middle Ages, they had all these conclaves where they would decide this. Huh? And this is called the can canon.
So there's two things. First, we have definitions, and secondly, they're extremely general, right? I can call this, this thing, I can measure any which way I want. So not only the usual commodities can be measured this way, and this is the examples I've been dealing with, but also rotational analogs, and now you get angular momentum. If you plug in an angle there, you know, you can plug in anything you like, and you get a corresponding canonical momentum, and you can get a you could call this a canonical price and a canonical convenience. Okay, a very very general setup, and we're still we're still only doing this. Uh, you see, what I decided to do here is go you go go th with you through the steps of the calculus of variation because. Normally, this gets glossed over really quickly. You know, you just do that and integration by parts, and all the intuition is lost. But the beautiful thing of economic engineering is every step here is intuition, okay? And every step here resolves a concept that you will, uh, if you ever ask yourself, what is the price and could we change it? Well, it's just this, okay? Huh? All right, and in the regular linear case, it will resolve to uh, what we know as momentum. But you can have the weirdest amount of momentum, weirdest cases of momentum, and the weirdest prices. This is why this stuff is just beautiful, and it's so easy. All right. And in mechanics, you can say, well, how weird that a particle would kind of do this variation, this virtual thing. Why would it ever want to do that, right? Now, there are good reasons to believe that that's exactly what it's doing, because you have all these quanta, and they don't know what they're doing. They're doing this, 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 and they're canceling each other out. But that's beside the point. For a human being, it's just really obvious. This is how you reason. Well, if we made this, no, 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 no. this is still the best, you know? So you find something called the admissible solution, you know? You just wiggle around until you feel good about what your you know, course of action is. Let's keep moving. So now comes the next step, and that's to move towards the Euler-Lagrange equation. Now normally this part gets done uh, under one magic sentence, like just you know, do an integration by parts. What I want to do here is just step you through this uh, carefully what that is. So the first thing I do is define what is called the cost basis. So I'm multiplying the price now by a change in the stock, not by a change in the in, in demand, right? So not P delta V, right, which is the change in demand, that's the extra cost you make, but this thing. So you, um, you increase your stock uh, at a particular price, uh, probably through a change in your demand, but that doesn't matter, you integrate that out, and that is known as the cost basis. Okay, I don't know why. Huh? Well, because the tax, the tax man uses that as to calculate your profit. Okay, how much did you buy this lot at? That's what they do, and that's the cost basis. So it's the basis which you can subtract then from uh, total. Uh, all right, it's just a name. And then we recognize, of course, the derivative of the price is a price movement or the force of demand, right? Huh? And this one, we also uh, are going to assume this, right? So that's just a flow. Yeah. So the units are in. Uh, yeah. This is the only concept you really need to know. Huh? It's just called the cost basis. It's, it's just super simple, right? I buy uh, three apples, right? Huh? And at, at this price, it's a word, that's the cost basis, all right? Huh? Now, I can calculate how the cost basis changes in time. That's what you do, right? So the value of this thing will go up and down. This little lot, this is called a lot sometimes. You imagine buying this lot, will go up and down. Huh? So if I calculate that out, you will see that the change of the cost basis is either due to a change in the price, right? Or a change in the amount that you're, uh, your change in the demand that you extend, huh? your extension of your demand, right? Huh? This is just the chain rule again, but economically you can see it makes a lot of sense. Okay? Right? So either you bought more, so your cost basis increases when you book these things, or your price went up, right? While you were buying. Okay? Now, if you, if you see that, you see, you, you realize that 
that this guy is now Right, so I just brought this to the other side. Huh? So now let's go back to where we left off, which was here. See, the problem I have here, I can't make much progress because I got to change this uh, demand and I got to change my stock a little bit, right? And now how do I minimize this? How do I set this equal to zero? Now, what would be nice if I got rid of this in some way? But I can since I know how to... Uh, express this term in terms of a change in the stock, right? Huh? Or there will be a change in the stock here and a change in the stock there, okay? So I just plug that in. So I take uh, this expression and I replace this uh, by it here, right? And that's what I get. It's simple. I still have to add this uh, the marginal cost, huh? the convenience to it. Are you guys with me? This is the integration by parts. It's just simple. Now, now let's integrate it. So I integrate this thing, right? So I get this term, right? Because if I integrate uh, with respect to time, this differential, I can just integrate it out. And I have to evaluate it from uh, t initial to t final. All right? Huh? And then uh, now I can collect these two together. Uh, and look at the convenience minus the price movement, okay? And the change in, the, in this thing, I multiply by the amount of the stock increase, and I have to do that over the whole period, right? Uh, okay. Simple. Uh, this is just simple math, but also conceptually it's quite simple. Uh, so the cost basis you can integrate out, and you know what the cost basis is. And uh, so all you need to do is what are the changes at the initial time minus the changes at the final time. But if I look at the different paths I took, you know, I have one path here and another path here. I always took those to be equal. There are no variations here. All the variations are in between. Okay. So these are were both zero. So this whole term is zero. Just the way I chose it. Otherwise, you have to add a call, uh, whatever it is. Huh? All right, so now I need to set this integral here to zero for any imagined variation, okay? So I can plug in anything here, here I want, and I want to be sure that this integral is here. The total accumulation here is zero. Now, how can I do that? Do you want me to prove that that can only be done if this... That difference is zero. I'm sure you don't want me to prove that, right? That's obvious. Okay? Because if it's not equal to zero, this thing can be anything at all, right? So if, if any term does not to zero, I just plug in something here, and presto, it's not zero, right? Huh? So the only way I can make this dumb thing zero is I set this equal to that, right? Huh? Yeah, it sounds Of course it does, because it says that you're in the minimum. It says your convenience balances out any uh, revaluations of the price that you're having, right? So you're saying, look, I'm going to try to sell or buy, but if, if it becomes inconvenient to lose, the, if the inconvenience of losing it is, is only, only when I can make somehow, if I uh, can make a profit on it. If I'm not making a profit, you know, I don't want my price change to get any bigger than the convenience that I have, you know, that's kind of what you're saying. But the other thing you can realize, this is just uh, the law of demand, you know? Huh? So it's just a movement along a demand curve, you know? Remember P, V, and this is M? Huh? It's just saying that this is the movement along the demand curve. It's just Newton's law. But that's also an economic interpretation. Right? Isn't it? That's just the law of demand. That's how I titled this slide. So you say, if you, take a, if you take anything, you're going to find out that what you're doing, if you minimize total period cost, is you're going to behave according to the law of demand. Okay? 
That's an incredible result, right? But this is very general. This price could be absolutely anything, and this could be absolutely anything. They've got to be constant. They've got to kind of belong to each other. This has to be a derivative of a, a Lagrangian with respect to a velocity where this was the accumulation of it, right? The stock belonging to that velocity. But if you do that, then you have a Newton equation here, right? Super general. So I think there's a very, normally it's written like this, you know? You'll see it like this in the literature. But that's not plugging in that this is P and uh, typical uh, derivatives, all right? But this thing has a name, it's called the Euler-Lagrange equation. But this is, all, this is what it does. Eh? And the rest is all, yeah, the rest is all, uh, yeah, a lot of work but variations on it. So you can have a Newtonian particle, but you can also have a rotating thing or something hideously complicated, you know? And we'll still, you know, it's still the idea of a force must be something that causes the change in the state of motion. An economic force must be something that causes a change in the state of demand. That's the only thing that's a saying, okay? Another way to see this is, look, there are only two equations. F is P dot and V is Q dot, right? So there are just two things that uh, you have, P and Q, and the flows in and out. Right? This one you kind of assumed, tacitly, nobody makes a big deal about this, but this better be the case, okay? You know, some, some previous slide you saw that, you know, it's, it's right here. And this thing is just saying, well, if you minimize this, then you gotta, and there is something called, you can kind of take whatever this economic force is and you can integrate it and you'll get something and it's called momentum and it doesn't get lost, it's just a, huh? So it's kind of the existence of the second energy storage element. They just uh, always come together. Huh? That's, that's it. That's all there is to it. So what we did, we started out with these two equations, and then, uh, you know, and then we set up our Q with whatever elements and R element, but well, we could have started out here when well, we knew what price was, what everything was, and then we say, all right, this is how everything behaves. All right? So we're done. We're, uh, we're not done yet, but basically the, the circle is round. You know, we took a completely different principle uh, that seems very general, uh, very convincing. Like, how are you going to complain against it? You know, if you complain, just take a different uh, Lagrangian, you know, that you feel is more appropriate. And then the machinery does the work. Right? All the mystery is gone. Except one, what's the R, R element, right? Uh, a couple of other mysteries. Okay? So what I want to do is just kind of apply it first to commodities. That's the thing we've been talking about. So we first look at the definition of price. Well, it's uh, the marginal running cost, right? Now just calculate it if you want, right? Well, that's that. Huh? And this is uh, Descartes' old thing. Huh? Notice you can go a step further and define M to be the partial of P with respect to V. Huh? So you can find the uh, inertance this way. And then it could even depend on V, I guess, and Q and other things, if you wanted to. In relativity, this thing would depend on V. It would be the, what do they call this? The relativistic mass or something? If you, if, yeah, they don't like to, but you, in this way, this would be the, not the real, real mass, not the rest mass, but the whatever it is. Huh? Well, same thing here. What is the convenience? Is this partial derivative, right? Huh? How, how do you running char cost change with the number of the stock? Now, that's the negative of the potential energy, right? Remember that. This one is a function of the quality demanded. This one is a function of the stock. So this one is zero. I keep the minus sign, right? 
So I get minus kq. Hey, the minus sign is important, right? This thing is, in fact, this is the correct thing. And what becomes the Euler Lagrange equation? So you get this minus minus that. This one. This is the equation of motion. As we, we all recognize this thing. Right? This is just a harmonic oscillator. Done. Well, you gotta know what this, this thing is, and you gotta know what that thing is, that's all. Huh? And then you're done. Hey, you can have different, you can have here M times G times Q or something. Right? So these are constants. This will be more like a gravitational force, but then for uh, economics, right? So you say the convenience is now not, doesn't go, and then if you look at the convenience, it will be just a constant, right? F is minus mg, right? Huh? It's just uh, the convenience of constant that is related to the elasticity huh? times some constant. It's perfectly valid economic engineering uh, convenience, all right? Anything you want. Something you might not have guessed uh, had you just done the regular uh, setup, right? Last slide. Let's look at uh, this business of interest, you know? We were, um, did we, I gave a presentation on this and uh, for Rabobank at the very beginning, and Emil has been uh, talking about this uh, in his uh, midterm, uh, midterm. He, um, is related to the rotational analog. Eh? So now we have a situation eh, where the particle has to stay on a circle. So it cannot go here, it cannot go there, it has to stay on a circle. Sometimes it's called a constraint, and we sometimes call it a holonomic constraint. That's not so relevant here now, but the particle has to stay on a circle. Now what's the problem with the Newtonian approach? How would Newton have solved this? Well, Newton would have said, okay, here's a particle, and uh, it has this coordinate and this coordinate, and I have two equations, and I calculate the forces, or I have to calculate the normal force and the tangential force, and I have to do something, okay? So it's a two-dimensional problem for Newton. He has two sets of equations. The Lagrangian approach is like, look, I just gotta choose my conjugate uh, variables, so what I'll do is I'll just take some angle theta here, uh, or let's call this pi, you know. And that's now my Q. Uh, so my Q, so Q is, is, is this psi angle. And then I just work with this psi. I use theta here. There's no problem, right? So I'll just look at my, and if I look at omega, which is uh, theta dot, well, let's call it theta since I use it here. So I can just calculate uh, the price. Now, if this is a regular uh, rotating bead or a thing, and this will be the kinetic energy, Macomb energy, right? I just calculate it, and I get this, uh, that the angular momentum, you usually call it L, is I times omega, all right? Now, that may not seem to you like much, and now you already knew that, and they taught you that. But that was a lot to Newton and his compatriots because they only knew how to do this for point particles. Then somebody calculated forever to take this and figure out that if you took all these equations, it would simplify to one equation where you define something called angular momentum. But it was different than regular momentum. Now how was it different? And how much more, many, how many more notions of momentum would you have, right? Uh, nobody knew that. So, in fact, most engineers don't know that, and they'll just, in bond graphs, they only have two, uh, two types of I elements. They have a, you know, a linear analog and a rotational one, and that's it, you know? And then they, they are done, okay? But this approach says, well, you can do that, but you can do something else, too. You could put in, you can constrain it to go along a hyperbola. Why not, right? 
I can do the same thing. And I'll do this, and I'll find out that I'll get an I element that is a hyperbolic rotation. There's going to be no problem. It's going to have a linear relationship as long as this is the, you know, kinetic co-energy or... Huh? Now, why is this important in economic engineering? Because this is one way we look at the interest. So the interest is the angle of velocity. The angle is the total accumulated interest. The arm, right, is the amount of invested capital. That's sometimes called the notional in a general way. And you're just looking at how the interest is uh, changing while you keep the arm uh, constant. Okay? So this is the N0. And then you can use all this uh, Lagrangian machinery uh, to calculate what an I element does, what a C element does, and you have your equation of motion and everything. It's just going to be fine and hunky-dory. You can, you can read your bond graphs the way you want. But this is now an angular uh, acceleration, and this is an angle, and uh, you've got to be careful. This is not the same K. This is some you know, torsional spring or something. Huh? So you got to be kind of careful what, what the different economic meaning is or physical meaning, but there is no doubt that the, uh, the machinery with this works. Did you see just how powerful this all is? You just set it up, you go, and then you get, if you get a bunch of linear equations, that's great, then you can use the bond graph mechanism because it's based on linear equations. If not, then you use, maybe you can use it too. Just be careful that you, you know, Super easy. So in, uh, I decided against having a separate lecture on the rotational analog. It would have taken us quite far. You know, it was uh, uh, long, and you do this, and you have the arm, and then you calculate, and then you show that this is the moment of inertia. You know how they do that in your beginning courses, and then you have to do this integration of all the inertia and all this crap, and then you figure out, yes, oh, in the end, I get this linear equation. Now you go, yeah. You know, of course, you still have to do all the hard work of calculating what this is. But the concepts are clear from the get-go. Right? And the other thing is, you don't have to worry too much about what the change in I and N is, the notional and the interest. You just forget about all that. You just take one canonical coordinate. So your Q space is just one dimensional, which is exactly that of the circle or the hyperbola. And then you just work with a good coordinate in that space. You adjust your notion of uh, economic force and of price, and you're off to the races. So this is really where, uh, conceptually, where I feel this uh, shines. Now let me make some concluding remarks now. So, we started this lecture thinking that we knew what we were doing. We got at bond graphs, we had this, we had the law of demand, we had Newton's law, and we could do it all. And then I told you there's going to be a total different way you can uh, look at it, which kind of makes more sense. Okay? And it's also much more general. Right? You go, all right, yeah, it makes more sense. But you should be astounded with the ease that we get at the results that we always knew. You know, they just kind of roll out like this, okay? And it makes all, all, everything makes sense, you know? It's just easy. That's why I used to do this just to get started, but somehow it didn't work. Somehow it seems that when you learn this stuff, you first have to kind of learn it the hard way, you know? And then you learn the easy way after you really understood the hard way. It's like the principle of virtual work. I have to teach that class once, and, uh, and we have to teach the principle of virtual work, and the students just blank out. I mean, they just can't get it. It's just too easy, you know? And you tell them, well, you can solve everybody. Oh, it's just that. You know, but after they spent like four years doing it the hard way, they go, wow, why didn't you tell me this before? You know? Huh? I mean, this is so easy. Now, now everything is clear. So there is something weird about the human mind that it first has to like uh, suffer before it can relieve itself uh, of the anxiety of the continuous amount of suffering that is wrought upon the practicing and educating engineer. So anyway, uh, we're here now. There's going to be a, 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 a quite a bit more lectures because there's a lot we're going to do with this. You know, and uh, it's a very exciting topic, a very fruitful, 
And uh, so we'll move to uh, Hamiltonian mechanics. Uh, I want to do notice stuff. Uh, I want to do, of course, friction in here, R elements. And uh, uh, it's just at the end of your lecture cycle. So as we near the end, we're going to be more and more phantasmagorical in the kind of stuff we're doing. And it's going to be much more uh, talking about the kind of research interests that we have and uh, rather than just regular lectures. So with that promise of a bright, bright, fun academic future, I'm going to leave you for now. Um, and then we'll see each other on Thursday. We'll have a very exciting Thursday, right? Because first of all, o Ozai will be giving us a midterm, right?